everyone hits a bump in the road. What do you do with it? Be inspired as we explore the ways people experience, navigate, and manage the ups and downs and twists and turns in this road trip called life. Today, I welcome Dr. Bernie Siegel to Bump in the Road. What can I say about Bernie? He attended Colgate and Cornell Medical College. He's a retired clinical professor of general and pediatric surgery at Yale. In addition to being a surgeon, he's a prolific author and speaker. But most of all, Bernie is an inspiration. He's the ultimate observer of the human condition and an endless storyteller. Over two podcasts, we explore perspectives on medicine and mind-body wellness, the incredible power of our personal stories, the power of life, death, and the role of love in our lives. Stories are what make a difference, I learned. Nobody fights about stories, especially when you're talking to doctors, um, you know, inciting things they don't believe in. But if it's a story, they don't feel threatened. See, if it's... You know, you're reciting a study that was in some medical journal, then they have to argue with you. What, why do you think doctors are intimidated sometimes? Well, because they become doctors for the wrong reasons. Like police, what's going on now? If you don't become a professional to help people, then you're all screwed up. And Jung said it a long time ago, doctors... The diagnosis helps the doctor, but it doesn't help the patient. For there, the key thing is the story, see? And doctors don't get into the patient's life. They're treating a disease. And it's sad. But as I say, nobody helps them understand why they became a doctor. And I'd say the police are the same thing. I mean, some would say, I'm a policeman because I want to help people keep them safe. And others, they want the power, the gun. You know what I mean? To be in charge, yeah. I think that's true across professions. Um, I, I, I think if you have a human motivation, it you wake up in the morning, you're inspired, you can you deal with whatever comes your way. But if your inspiration is money or power or prestige, those are so fleeting. Yeah, and and for me, I wanted to help people. It's one of the biggest reasons I became a doctor. And then what changed me was I realized I can't help everyone. It was so painful uh, to see, you know, what God didn't fix and what I couldn't fix. And that that's what led me off in a whole new direction. You know, helping people live and faith and everything else was a big part of. Uh, that's why even shaving my head was something I had to do in 1970. It upset our children enormously because the style then was having your hair down to your shoulders. And, but I told the barber, you got to shave my head. And um, then again, reading Jung, I came across this little article that the reason monks shave their head is to uncover their spirituality. Oh, how interesting. And he, he said, the word is a tonsure, T-O-N-S-U-R-E. It's a special kind of haircut. When I read that, it was like, oh boy, if I'd been in therapy I would have realized I don't have to shave my head. I have to uncover what's within me. And that was something Elizabeth Cooper Ross and many others would always say to me, Bernie, what are you covering up when I drew a picture um, and used white uh, crayon to, to put snow on a mountain? She said, the paper's already white. What do you need to put, you know, you added a layer. And when I painted my own portrait, I painted myself as a surgeon cap, mask, and gown. If you come in the house, you don't know it's me. I mean, it, it was amazing. Once I sought therapy, then I began to understand myself. I, I think art therapy and the power of symbolism is huge. Art is, that's something that, that you know, needs to be in medical education and is not because people know what's going on within them. So in drawings, I would see anatomy. And again, the art therapists and some Jungians would say, oh, Jung was fascinated by the somatic aspects. I said, yeah, he was a doctor. He knew anatomy. If you're an art therapist, you don't know that you're seeing anatomy in the drawing. And see, those things became fascinating at the hospital. 
then I wasn't considered so crazy. You know, because, has medical but, has medical education changed much in the last 30 or 40 years, do you think? Uh, not much, no. Uh, a lot of times I write to the schools and say, hey, would you like me to come by? You don't get an answer, you know. When my first book came out, Love, Medicine, Miracles, and I was, you know, on all the talk shows and everything. Yeah, then some of the schools, the students, though, invited me to speak at their graduations. They, not the, you know, the faculty, but the, the students. And I used to have a lot of students come to work with me. Um, again, the Yale uh, Medical School got in touch with me and said, why are all these students coming to see you and be with you? I said, because they love what I'm doing and they want to learn from me. Um, and I said, I had applied to be a course, but you gave me so many papers to fill out. It was ridiculous. So I didn't bother. Well, after they saw how popular I was, I got a letter saying, we're making you a course. I didn't have to fill out one piece of paper. <laughs> Yeah, your 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 route though has not been that easy. I mean, I think you were met with a lot of skepticism early on, and and a lot of it was really brutal. Yeah, I have a whole bunch of magazines that I found going through the house. I have them in the other room, and it's the controversial. That's the headline on the magazine cover: the controversial Dr. Siegel. Yeah, and the people who came to interview me, it, it was painful because. They didn't agree with me, and they weren't really say, writing what I was saying. That was the part I learned. Everybody was putting their interpretation of me down, not me. And even on Oprah, she loved having me there because she didn't tell me, but she'd always have other doctors there to argue with me, so her shows were exciting. And, I mean, she, I know, agreed with me, but was putting on a show, you know what I mean? So I'd sit there and argue with all these doctors and they would quote me and I'd say, I never said that. Oh yes, it's on page 127. She'd open the book and say, no, it's not there. And you'd realize again, it's their interpretation. You know, like saying to a patient, what's going on in your life? Oh, you're blaming your patients. I said, what are you talking about? You ask them what's happening in their life. You're blaming them for getting sick. I said, no, I'm trying to help them get well, not blaming them. But you see, they everything got turned around. And one reporter, you talk about drawings. I, I have her drawing because she came in. I could tell how negative and intellectual she was. I said, draw a picture for me and then we'll have an interview. And I'm seeing a couple of patients and then we'll be ready. So when I'm done with the patients, I came in and she handed me a drawing. And there was a clock on the wall behind her with one hand pointed at 12. And her picture of herself showed this big head on her body, which I knew she was this intellectual, you know, but I figured I got to shake her up. So instead of saying, why is 12 important to you? I said, what happened when you were 12 years old? I don't like deadlines. What happened when you were 12 years old? And then came the breakdown in the tears because she had been sexually abused when she was 12. Wow. And again, I learned those things in my own drawings with, and giving them to Elizabeth Google Ross because she'd say, why is 11 important? I said, what kind of question is that? Well, you made 11 trees. I said, oh, I've been doing this work 11 months. I mean, as soon as she would ask me things, I'd have an answer. And, and that's what made me go to the hospital with a box of crayons and say to patients, hey, draw a picture. And it was amazing how I learned what other people already knew. You know what I mean? So I knew it was true, what you were learning. You know, um, one of the things that you point out is how powerful words are, particularly coming from an authority figure like a doctor. And I, I think words convey so much power. Let um, me say this to you, because one of our kids came home with this. What happens when you write words, 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 with no space between the words and the letters? What do they become? Swords. Yeah. He came home from school and brought in this big canvas. I could hold it up for you if you want to see it. It's in the house. And it said words, 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 swords, swords. And I looked at it and I thought, oh, my God, I can kill a cure with words or a sword. And his teacher didn't know why he did it. And I didn't either. 
but I think he was a part of my past life and he was teaching me something for, it was an art class and he just filled this canvas with words. And, but boy, was that therapy for me, for the, you know, your kid about this high, you know, to walk in carrying that canvas. And I looked at it and it's hanging on the wall to keep reminding me. That that's that's really interesting. What a story! Um, one of the things you know you, you talk about, you say doctors need to um, understand that what people need that that what people need treatment is not just their di- in treatment is not just their diagnosis, mm. but their experience. Right. Well, I'll give you two examples. What I learned to say to people was, "What are you experiencing?" What are you going through? How would you describe it? And I said, I'm not asking you for a diagnosis. I want your experience. And words would pop out of people. I mean, rarely, but some would say it's a wake up call, a blessing, a new beginning. Fine. I knew they were, you know, redirecting their life. But then you hear words like, I have a lot of pain. What is it like? Pressure. So my question is, What else in your life fits that word? Failure. What else in your life fits that word? Now, these two women, the pressure lady, I was trying to help her in the emergency room because they told me she was in such intense pain that they were going to be sending her up, you know, to a hospital bed. So I went in, did a meditation with her to relieve the pressure. Because she wasn't my patient, I didn't feel I had a right to say, okay, what's going on in your life that's causing you pressure? So I just did it in in an imagery about relieving the pressure in your life. And then I went out after about 10 or 15 minutes. And a little while later, the nurse came over and said, it's her marriage. Her pain is gone. She's going home now to work on her marriage. Now, that impressed the hell out of me. You know, in 10 minutes, she's free of pain, knows why it's happening and going home. The other was really interesting. I said, where does failure fit your life? She said, well, my body's failed. I have cancer. I said, that's not my question. How does failure fit your life? Oh, my parents committed suicide when I was a child. I must have been a failure as a child. Oh, that's a terrible thing to internalize. Yeah. And I remember years ago, I had vertigo um, and it was hard for me to stand up, you know. Uh, I'd have a spell and I'd have to lie down. So one day I got out of bed and I said, hey, stupid, why don't you do what you tell your patients to do? What's it like that vertigo? I said, well, the world is spinning around. And then I thought, yeah, that's what you're body is trying to get you to do. Take it easy, rest, stop running around, traveling everywhere, speaking. So you got a problem where you can't, you have to rest and lie down. And, you know, so it helped me (laughs) to act like my own patient and realize, yeah, this symptom is perfect for you because you need time off, take it easy. So it's doing it to you. Yeah. Now, I know at Yale, the other doctors always talked about your patients. Your Mm. patients were perceived as different. Well, they got, eventually, they got a wonderful title, Siegel's Crazy Patient. (laughs) And that was a compliment that, that, that then they were happy to take care of them because they did so well. You know what I mean? They didn't have all the side effects. And, uh, and here again, literally what happened. Remind me to talk about the operating room, too. Um, the This was a patient who came up here because a relative knew me. She was helping my father-in-law uh, with his health problems. Uh, so she said, come up here. Dr. Siegel makes people well all the time. Well, this woman shows up. She's got leukemia, told she was going to die in two months. And her doctor said, don't waste your time going for chemotherapy and driving to Duke. She's in North Carolina. Um you might as well just go home and enjoy your last two months. So that's when her cousin said, come up here. So she shows up and I said, you have leukemia, which is not something I can take care of. I'm a surgeon, but I'll get one of my doctor friends to come in. 
Now, at this point, yeah, he was my doctor friend. This was a doctor, an oncologist, whose group criticized me, telling me, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm starting support groups. I could be killing people, not helping them. I mean, they yelled at me for hours. But then they began to take care of my patients and saw the difference. So the oncologist comes over. He sees her sends me a note, Bernie, I agree with her doctor. She's got two months to live. And this is a quote. He said, but I know you and your crazy patients. So I'll give her hope. They I'll give her hope. Two weeks later, I get a note doing well. Two weeks later, doing very well. Three, well, no, six weeks later, in complete remission, isn't chemotherapy wonderful? And I knew he was saying that, you know, with a smile on his face because he didn't have any faith in it, but his hope. Yeah. And then the mind body radiation therapist calls me. I thought the machine was broken because this woman has no reaction to radiation. Then I saw your name in the chart. So I thought, oh, it's a crazy patient. <laughs> So I said to her, why don't you have a reaction? She said, I get out of the way and I let it go to my tumor. Okay. And then there were others where the machine was repaired and the radioactive material not put back in. Uh, Cause I don't make up any of these stories. And the doctor called me to say, Oh God, I feel awful. I said, what is it? He said, I haven't treated anybody for a month. They repaired the machine. They never put the radioactive material back in. I just did the routine monthly inspection and noticed that. He said, I feel so terrible. I haven't treated. I said, look, calm down. Are you stupid? He said, no, I'm not stupid. What are you saying? <laughs> I said, how come you didn't know you weren't treating anybody? And then he almost fainted. I said, it's because they all acted as if they were being treated. So you thought they were, uh, you see, it blew his mind away because it never occurred to him. People could act as if they were being treated when they weren't. So that's what got so many doctors to change their opinion of me when we were, you know, dealing with a common patient and they could see the difference in one of Siegel's crazy patients you know, versus a traditional one who's having all the side effects and all the problems. And that, again, is where the drawings came in. If you drew the devil giving you poison, see, or the operating room is an empty room all in black, I'd say, don't do it. And they'd say, well, I, I need to do it. I want to do it. Then you have to change your attitude about it. I want you to picture yourself going to surgery, going for chemotherapy, everything going well, you know, no loss of hair, no loss of appetite, everything fine, tumor drinking, do that four or five times a day for a week, then go for your first treatment. And it was wonderful, the difference. Their pictures were very different. When I'd say draw a new picture a week later, and then they weren't having side effects because they, see the body believes, if you're five times a day, you're picturing yourself getting chemotherapy with no side effects, by the time you go a week later, you've had 35 treatments with no side effects. So your body believes that. And literally my surgical patients, because the nurses used to say, your patients are a problem. I said, what are you talking about? They're refusing pain medication. And the nurse never thought they're not hurting because they had major abdominal surgery. But I said, they're not hurting. And that had a lot to do with my talking to them while they were anesthetized, playing music in the operating room, all these things that when people saw it work, see, I, I always said nobody was against the patient doing well. But if they thought you're a nut, you know, case and crazy, they weren't going to do it. But when they saw it working, then they all started doing it because it worked. And even a coloring book was put together by one of the anesthesiologists because I did a lot of children's surgery. So every time a child showed up for surgery, they were handed this coloring book to fill in all the pages. And it included the operating room meeting the anesthesiologist. And it was amazing the stuff that showed up.
I mean, oh, I can imagine one more story that the page said you will meet someone called an anesthesiologist dressed in something that looks like green pajamas. This kid drew the anesthesiologist in red and it says he's in green. So I said, look, there's something dangerous here. And he said, oh, yeah, his mother has muscular dystrophy. He could have a genetic defect. So muscle relaxants have an adverse effect on him and can be very dangerous. I said, then look at the last page. If he draws himself purple, I'm sending him home. I'm not going to operate on him and risk his life because that's a spiritual color that often represents death. And we turn to the last page and no purple, just red and black. You know, I'm hurting. I'm not happy. Um, so we went ahead with the surgery. But that's the part, you see, that convinced anesthesiologists and others that these kids and adults, too, knew what was going on in their body and had this intuitive, unconscious knowledge. Um, I mean, it wasn't unconscious anymore, but it was coming from consciousness and it could be portrayed in dreams or drawings. I, I think intuition is incredibly important, don't you? Oh, yes, absolutely. I, I mean, my whole life, I follow it. Well, again, I quote Jung often. He said, the future is unconsciously prepared long in advance and therefore can be guessed by clairvoyance. So on the drawings, literally, because I learned all this from Elizabeth Kugel Ross, who had Jungian background too, there on the page, there are quadrants of the page that are past, present, and future. So where you put something on the page, like the upper lot left of the page is the far future or death concept. Okay? So when I say the far future, it could be where somebody's going to live, what job they're going to take, you know, things like that. Like if you said, I don't know whether to move or not move, I'd say, draw me a picture. And if you put it in that quadrant, I say you're heading there. Say, um, if you see a purple kite going up in the sky, you knew they're saying I'm going to be dying in the near future. Um, so all those things help me inform the, you know, the patient and their families about the future. Just to give you an understanding, it's not wasn't depressing to people. One nurse friend of mine drew a kite in that side, but her husband was flying the kite, this purple kite. So I said to her, you're ready to go, but he can't let go. I said, we need to talk to him. So he came to the hospital on one of his visits and he said, look, if you die, I'm dead. She's a nurse. He said, you do everything. You take care of the house, you take care of the meals, you take care of the family. I don't know how to do a damn thing. If you die, I'm dead. So she said, all right, I won't die. I'll train you. So she spent, I think it was about six weeks. And again, there were six trees in that part of the picture. And so six weeks later, he said to her, okay, honey, I've cut the string. You can go. And she died. On Thursday, she said, when the kids get here from California, I'll die. So the kids came and she died with the family there. But those are the things, how helpful it was to families and also especially to parents. You know, when your child draws a purple balloon going up in the sky, you can say, look, your kid's ready to go. Stop putting the kid through all kinds of treatment, going to more medical centers, traveling, do that. And this one child, when I got the mother to stop, in her picture, there were like seven or eight pretty like flower-like things. And I said, I'm not sure what this is about. She's ready to go with this purple balloon going and her name in it. But I don't know why all these pretty things are here. It didn't sort of fit. Mother took her home from the hospital and then the phone call. Bernie, what, today's my birthday. Amber woke up and said, Mom, I'm dying today as a gift to you to free you from all the trouble. And then we realized the, de the pretty symbols were the days left in her life. Yeah. To what extent do you think that studying this mind-body connection through art, through, through talk, can replace 
a, a piece of modern medicine. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it doesn't have to replace anything. It can be, you know, integrated. So again, if I said, here's a blood pressure pill, here's a, you know, a diarrhea pill, whatever, and the person saw it in a negative way, then you can help them prepare themselves for it. You see, by seeing the treatment as helping them feeling wonderful, and then you can avoid all the side effects. I tell people literally, don't read the side effects when you, you know, pick up the prescription, give the list to your family. See, so you're not hypnotized by it. So if you have a terrible headache, say to the family, is that on the list of my medicine? And if it isn't, then you have a headache, but it's not. <laughs> yeah, because one, uh, one person in our group, she said her mother has visual problems and the mother was having side effects of chemotherapy. She said, I need a pill for my nausea. So the daughter ran, got something, gave it to her. A few hours later, the mother says, I need another one. This time she had her glasses on. Daughter gives her the pill. She says, what the hell are you doing? This is my compazine. I mean, this is my Coumadin, my anticoagulant. What are you giving me that for? She said, Ma, I saw it had a C printed on it. So I thought it was your composine and it helped you last time I gave it to you. See? She gave her the wrong pill. The mother thinks it's the right thing and she's cured of her problem. Well, because another, of the power of suggestion. People, yeah, especially friends. I say, if you're going to have surgery, talk to your body and visualize the blood leaving the area of the surgery so it'll be easier for the surgeon. And one friend of mine, uh, he did that. I mean, he knows me. We do different things together. He has something called the Happiness Club, uh, Lionel Ketchian. So he prepared himself. And he told the surgeon what I had told him. Uh, he wasn't afraid, you know, he'll call me crazy, that kind of thing. After surgery, the surgeon said it was quite amazing that there was practically no bleeding at all. It was so easy for me to do the procedure. Um, and then you see he's realizing what he has been told can help. So you can tell it to other patients. I have an article on my website called Deceiving People Into Health. Because again, as I mentioned, I did a lot of children's surgery. So I lied to kids all the time to hypnotize them. And the one I mentioned, especially if I go to have blood drawn, I always tell the the person doing the blood, the hematology you know, person, um, tell this to all the kids. You take the alcohol sponge, you rub their skin and say, this is going to clean your skin. But it's a new sponge. It makes it numb also. So you're not going to feel the needle. And literally 90% of the kids said, Oh boy, that's wonderful. Why don't the other doctors do that? <laughs> and a few would say, I felt it, but it was a different sensation, if you know what I mean. Yeah, and, and it wasn't full of fear. Deal. I felt it. Yeah, I said, Oh, but bad sponge, and I throw it away. So they weren't blaming me for lying. But it that's why I like calling it deceiving people into health. It's amazing, again, how powerful your mind is in getting your body to believe things and do things. No, I'm, I'm on the same page with you. Um, one of the things that you, you wrote is that joy brings you strength because it's a trance state. And is there any reason why we can't live in a trance state full of joy? Yeah, what I found when people are happy, when you make them laugh, they can't be afraid. That's why I was a clown in the operating room. I mean, adults knew I was acting like a clown and didn't get worried that, you know, is he capable of operating on me? But the kids would sometimes look at their parents. You're not going to let him operate. He's crazy. Because I was doing silly things to get them to laugh. Even blowing up gloves. You know, you're wearing gloves in the operating room. I blow them up and put a face on them and, you know, make the fingers into hair and all kinds of crazy things to distract the kids and play music for them and children's music. 
So they'd be listening to their types of songs. And that also made everybody in the operating room feel better. You listen to music from your childhood and they're all smiling and feeling like kids again. So everybody was happy. Now the other side, uh, you hear Frank Sinatra singing, why not take all of me or amazing grace. And I'd have patients who were not, you know, put to sleep. They were anesthetized locally, like a spinal anesthetic. I'd hear, is everything all right? I say, what are you talking about? <laughs> Listen to the song. All of me, why not take all of me? <laughs> so everybody would laugh. And one lady who was in intense fear, I was really worried about her because I thought if I take her in the operating room, she could have a cardiac arrhythmia, something's going to happen to her. But after about 45 minutes of trying to calm her down in the hallway of the operating room, I said, look, we can't go on like this anymore. I've got to get you in there. So I wheeled her in. She says, thank God, all these wonderful people are going to take care of me. I knew that's, you know, more of her craziness trying to reassure herself. So I said, look, I've worked with them for years. They're not wonderful people. And for a moment, I thought she's going to run down the hallway. <laughs> <laughs> but then she burst out laughing with everybody else in the operating room because the nurses and anesthesiologists, they know I'm crazy Siegel, you know, that I don't behave like other surgeons. So everybody busted out laughing and the patient too. And in that minute, I realized how beautiful it was. We were all a family then. In one minute, her fear was gone, and we were all family, loving each other, laughing together, and she had no trouble with surgery. You and, know, you uh, talk about play and laughter. You have made your work, your play, haven't you? I try to, yeah. In our next podcast, we continue our conversation. In the meantime, let me leave you with a personal story about my first encounter with Bernie. It was at Yale in the early 80s. Bernie was talking to a room full of surgeons about his personal approach to his patients. Around me, I heard laughter. The surgical banter and jokes. Cold steel for a quick heal. Don't let skin stand between you and the diagnosis. Mocked Bernie's humanistic approach to medicine. I tell this story because Bernie's path wasn't always easy. But in his soul, he knew he was on the right path for him. I admire his willingness to dance to a different drummer and his humanistic approach to his patients. And I also admire the fact that he didn't let a bump in the road deter him from his destiny. Stay tuned for part two of our conversation. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you found something in today's podcast that inspires you along your own life path because sometimes a bump in the road is actually a portal into a more conscious and meaningful life. Bump in the Road is a production of Cancer Road Trip. Subscribe to the podcast, follow us on social media at Cancer Road Trip, and you can learn more at www.cancerroadtrip.com. Until next time, be safe and be well.